He loves us. Oh, your hand and we will get you an envelope to record your offering amen psalm 107 the first two verses says oh give thanks unto the lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever let the redeemed of the lord say so whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy as the lord redeemed anybody in this house tonight oh give thanks it says unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy I'm glad God redeemed my life many many years ago and he'll keep you if you want to be kept can you say amen He'll keep you. It's not hard to walk with God. Just give him your all. In your giving tonight, remember the house of God. Remember the air conditioning. Remember the lights. Remember the house of God so that God can have mercy on someone else who comes through those doors. Can we do that tonight? Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your great mercy, Lord. The Bible said, mercy rejoices against judgment. God, you don't want to judge anybody. You want to love on everybody. You want to have mercy on everybody. You truly love your people, your creation. So, Lord, bless every giver as they give to you tonight, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. God bless you in your giving. sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word and just to rest upon his promise just to
teaching us to trust you more and more, God. Through life's struggles and through its victories, God, you're teaching us to rely more on you, God. We thank you for the lessons. We thank you that you're drawing us closer to you, God. Thank you for that grace, Father, and bless your word to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name. Well, welcome out to Bible study tonight. It's like we have a few visitors. Welcome out. It's so nice to have you with us tonight. Amen. I like that song that they finished with, Oh, for Grace to Trust Him More. And when I think about the life of Noah, who we've been talking about for a couple weeks now, that's what I see in his life is trust. And uh, our first week, we dealt with Noah and some of his attributes. And when last week, we talked a little bit more uh, seriously and solemnly, I suppose, about some of the things that he was going through in his day and related it to our day. And suddenly it's not just Noah going through a hard time. <laughs> we found ourselves in the middle of it. But I'm glad that Noah found grace. So can you and so can I in this day. That the situations of our day don't deter God. Amen? Amen. He said that there's more grace to be had as we look to him. Amen? So I'm thankful for that. Our focus isn't on the sins of our day or the wickedness around us. It's, and if we're not careful, it can affect us. Can somebody say amen? amen? I know you look on the news for just a moment or two, and it's easy to get overwhelmed and get saddened, isn't it? That's when we have to pull ourselves back and refocus on the Lord. Amen? 
You can get swallowed up in the sorrows of our day to where that's all you see and find ourselves lacking what we need, not only to walk with God effectively, but to reach out to somebody else. Can somebody say amen? amen. The thing that I like about the Bible and throughout the different characters of the Old Testament in particular and the New Testament is the Bible's not careful to hide or gloss over some of their struggles, some of the situations that they found themselves in. And because of that, we can relate, but more importantly, we can find hope. Because God gave them the strength and the power to get through, amen? And I like that about the Bible. And sometimes I have to learn myself that instead of looking at the weaknesses and the struggles and those types of things, is to look at the possibility of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Got to look at God's possibility in this. What can God do if we'll give ourselves to him the way Noah did? Now, some have said that Noah's day was pretty bad, and yes, it was. And some may say that our day is worse, but I thank God, he said, be of good cheer. Somebody look at somebody and say, be of good cheer. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Go ahead, you can tell them that. And so can you, amen? Amen. I was reading this week, and he says, I have not left you comfortless. I haven't left you without hope. I was looking at that word comfortless, and it meant, I haven't left you an orphan. Aren't you glad your heavenly Father hasn't left you all by yourself? Would you look at somebody and say, there's possibility with God. At one point, the disciples asked Jesus a question, and Jesus had laid it on, and he just gave it to them straight, and then they said, Lord, who can be saved? And he says, you know, with you, it's an impossibility, but with God, but with God, all things are possible. Well, Lord, you don't know what I'm going through, but with God. Well, you don't know what family I came out of, but with God. Sometimes we get like Paul and we view ourselves as the impossibility. But with God. Doesn't matter what side of the tracks you came up. What matters is what side you end up on. Are you on God's side tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you turn in your Bibles with us tonight, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 6 and 7. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 6 and 7, and it's a very familiar passage of Scripture, and it'll be our main focus for tonight. You can tell all the dads ate really good on Father's Day. You're sitting really low in your seats. Amen. You know, I had a great Father's Day. We had some shrimp and some steak. It was fantastic. Thinking about putting in a petition to make next Sunday Father's Day, too. Are you there? Hebrews eleven six 6 and 7, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. I want to talk for just a moment on this thought, and we'll hit a few other thoughts, key points, but God searched the whole world, and he found one person of faith in his family. Out of millions, God found one. Many times I find myself reading the account of Noah and getting overwhelmed by the fact of how many people missed the mark. 
And it seemed like rejoicing over Noah making it and being successful, it seemed like it felt out of place to me. But I'm glad it wasn't out of place for God. God didn't need 10 million people. God just needed one person. One person to believe in Him. One person to walk with Him. Can somebody say amen? Can somebody say, I want to be that person? I always thought if Noah had more resources, he could pay more laborers and maybe he could have finished quicker. If he got more converts saved, maybe Noah could have, you know, finished things up quicker and moved things along. There's a thousand scenarios, but the fact remains only eight were saved. And God was willing to wait for those eight to do their job, even if it took a long time. Could God have said that I'm done with everybody and started over? Just forget the whole thing. Only Noah and his family, they're the only ones, and let's just wipe the slate clean. Could he have done that? Yes. He was prepared to do that in Moses' day in Deuteronomy 9.14. He said, Moses, stand back, and I'll make a nation of you. And we know that no, uh, Moses interceded on the behalf, and there was mercy. We see an account of another man of God who walked with God and said, God, will you destroy this city if there's 50 just people? And eventually worked them down to 10. The point is, is that God won't deal with the righteous and the unrighteous the same. That there is mercy and grace for those that walk with God. Can somebody say amen? He's a God that can do whatever He wants, but He has a character that He's making plain. Now, I have a great, not a great, I, I better catch myself on that. I have a decent tolerance of pain. A, you know, that threshold where you can put up with a little bit. Well, about two weeks ago, I spent my Saturday night in the emergency room. I got into a tangle with my electric hedge clippers, and I lost. Thankfully, God was merciful. It didn't dig me up too bad, but I did need a few stitches. And I was fine sitting there. I was okay when the nurse walked in. I was fine when he brought the bandages. I was fine when he sat and made some jokes and got me laughing. I was okay with that. It really didn't hurt that bad. It didn't even bother me when he pulled out the needle and the needle was about that long. What bothered me is when he stuck it in my finger. I learned real quick my threshold for pain, that kind of pain, is about 0.5 seconds. <laughs> then I wanted it to be over in a hurry. But God has a different threshold than my threshold. And in this day, God's heart was saddened and in pain over what had happened to his beautiful creation. But we'll read in 1 Peter 3.20, and you can jot down 29 if you're a note taker. But it talks about when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few that were eight souls were saved by water. And to me, the part that stuck out to me is that God was willing to go through this period of heartache for eight people. It seemed like such an extravagant expense on the part of God, but God was willing to be in pain and wait so that eight people out of millions, perhaps, could be saved. I don't know about you, but that is overwhelming to me. You think somebody of infinite power who could just, with one brush of his hand, just wipe away all pain and sorrow, but yet he was willing to wait. Why would God go through all of this for just one person and his family? We already sang it tonight. Oh, how he loves us. For God so loved the world. That he was willing to wait. Second Peter 2 9 says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. 
and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. God knows how to deliver you. As I was looking at this word deliver, thinking about Noah, I couldn't help but get excited when I seen the, un the, the, the meaning of this word. It says, to draw to oneself. Thinking about Noah in that time frame, and uh, probably a lot of these people were distant relatives. Figure it was a relatively few generations since Adam. Can imagine all those types of emotions and feelings and the temptations to be pulled here and there. And yet God delivered him out of them all. I always used to think that when we talk about deliverance, it was just God getting the enemy off your back. But it meant that God pulled him to himself. Like a father who pulls you to himself, God will pull you to himself. He knows right where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows what others are saying, and yes, He even knows how the circumstances are stacked up, but He will deliver the godly in their time of need. Can somebody say amen? amen. I read Psalms 34, 19. It says, Many are the afflictions. Many are the distresses. Many are the adversities, many are the hurts and sorrows of the righteous, but the Lord pulls them unto himself. <laughs> right in the middle of Noah's day, God showed up. I know I have to have at least one person here tonight who it should have ended up a whole lot different. But God showed up. I know your story would read differently tonight. If it wasn't for that one night, the answer came right on time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know. I know the story could be different, and maybe I'll understand it by and by, but can I tell you, I'm thankful for that night he showed up on my behalf. I almost let go, but thank God. Thank God he wouldn't let go. Thank God he wouldn't let go when I couldn't hold on. Or so it felt. It could have been a lot different. But the Lord pulled us to Himself. Can you let Him know you're glad about it? I'm glad you didn't let go. You'll have to forgive me for a moment, but... I'm glad he didn't let go of me. I love those old songs when he reached down his hand. I was lost and undone, but thank God, thank God he reached way down. Man, I feel something right there. Why don't we just put our hands up for a moment? Thank you, Jesus. God has the right to do whatever He wants whenever He wants to do it. He doesn't need your permission and He don't need mine. He's God all by Himself. He doesn't need anyone to cue Him up, work Him up. He is God. He can speak a word in a moment and everything changes. He spoke words, worlds into existence. And you're worried that you've somehow ruined the plan of God for your life. How interesting that you think God's plan is that fragile and you're that strong. God doesn't need anyone to announce that He's arrived or that He's done what He intended to do and He's left the building. God can show up in the middle, do His work, 
And you'll look at it afterwards and say, surely it had to be God. I don't know how it happened, but it happened. He's God all by himself. It blesses me, and I, I may hit this point several times tonight, but God was willing to save one family in the entire world. I mean, that point just it boggles my mind that one family caught the attention of God out of everybody. He won't forget His promises to you. He won't forget your labor of love and faithfulness. I read Luke 21, 36, and it says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I, I read in that Hebrews 11 that Noah pleased God. Have you ever found that there's some people you just can't please? No matter what you do? Trying to please them is like trying to hit a moving target. It's here, it's there, it's there. When you get there, it's there. But I'm glad God's not like that. God can be pleased. God can be pleased. Would you look at somebody seeing that? I, I, maybe the mic stopped working. Can you look at your neighbor and tell them, God can be pleased. Would you say this to them? God can be pleased with you. God can be pleased with me. God can be pleased when we walk by faith. When we believe that He's God. And that He can do whatever He said He can do. Noah believed God and acted on that belief. I'm sure people tried to move him from what God said with peer pressures and all the pressures that we spoke on last week. I can almost hear it, in, maybe because it's some of the things that we've gone through, but I, it rings so clear today even. Noah, I'm your aunt. Do you realize what you're doing to the family name with this crazy ark business? Your father would roll over in his grave if he seen you doing all this. Seth worshipped God, and he didn't need a boat. Enoch was taken up to heaven. He didn't need a boat. Why do you? Your daddy didn't need a boat. Why do you? What makes you so special? Noah, I'm your third cousin. Why don't you just come stay with me for a little while till this thought wears off? At the very least, Noah, just give us your kids so they're shielded from all this nonsense. Can't you almost hear it? If you put yourself in Noah's shoes, I'm sure Noah had his heartstrings pulled in a lot of directions. Why dream that dream? Why hold on to that faith that seems so outdated in 2019? Noah, I don't see people doing it like this. Can you imagine how absurd it must have looked to people? They say it was 20 miles from the water or so that he built this ark. Noah, there's no water around. Why are you building it there? Noah, why are you talking this way? Noah, why don't you just come and spend a little more time with us? But Noah loved God and kept the faith that was given to him no matter what. I got in my office this afternoon and it was that word, just those three words, no matter what. There are a lot of things you can fit into those three words. Noah loved God no matter what. This is why he was a hero. That anchor, it holds. I was thinking of the old song Sister Chris used to sing about the old ship of Zion. It's been through the storms. Oh yes. 
And I don't know the word, so I kept saying that one part over and over. And I kept saying, oh yes. But one of these days, that old ship is going to move up a little higher. Hallelujah. No, sir, this world's not our home. And if I get too excited right here, I'm going to preach next week's message. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10, it says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. God found one man. And for that man, God had prepared a plan, even in the middle of that sinful day. That famous scripture in Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God had thoughts of peace for Noah and an inspected end. But Noah had a job, a plan he had to follow. And his plan, his job was to do this, to take the invisible things in the heart of God and make them a living reality. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Genesis 6, 13 through 22. Genesis 6, 13 through 22. God had a specific plan for Noah. Genesis 6, it's the first book of the Bible. Turn in a few pages and you should be pretty close. We're going to get started reading. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark? And shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window thou shalt make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring flood waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee, but with thee, will I establish my covenant, and you shall come into the ark. You and your sons, and your wife and your sons' wives with you, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee. And it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. So it seems that God's plan was pretty clear and specific, amen? I've got a bit of trivia for you guys right here. How many sets of clean animals did God tell him to bring into the ark? Oh, I hear you you guys are Bible scholars. I thought I was pulling a fast one on you. For those of you who don't know it, you look it up. You'll see it. If you say it's one pair, that's not quite the correct answer. Oh, somebody just spoiled it. 
Somebody just gave us the cliff notes. It's seven pair. So God sent seven pair for food and for sacrifice. Some people believe that that's where unicorns went extinct is they ended up going on the deck where the carnivores were and that was the end of them. <laughs> we'll have to read between the lines on that one. But the ark was about 450 feet. And it was about 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. Imagine this. This is what God is describing to Noah. But Noah's got to see this vision in the heart of God. And then he's got to build it. The one thing that was interesting to me when you look at the ark, there was never a rudder or a sail. There was never a steering wheel. Now if I was a preacher right here, I might go ahead and say something along the lines that when he got in the boat, he just had to go where the current went. If I was going to preach that, maybe I would say sometimes you just have to go where the Spirit leads you. You don't always get to choose where you go. Noah, you're not going to be able to control this thing. Wouldn't it be great if God gave us a steering wheel on a lot of things in life? Might be some people we avoid. Some situations we get away from. But there's some things that God says, you know what? You're not going to be steering this situation. I am. You're just going to have to trust me through it. Can somebody say amen? I heard Reverend Teachman share on one of his posts online about hearing the voice of God, and it was too good not to include here. How you have to seek him until you hear his voice specifically and clearly for your life. He shared how there is a general obedience, you know, the pray every day, read your Bible, pay your tithes, do good works, be kind to people, witness. Called it a general obedience. But then he said there's a specific obedience for your life and mine. And what caught me is when he said this, he says, when God spoke to him and said, go to Pakistan, he said, I just started preparing. Now that's what God is saying to Reverend Teachman. He's probably not saying that to everybody here tonight. But it doesn't change the point that God has a specific plan just for you and I. And we need that same leading of God for our lives. Can somebody say amen? A little while ago, the Lord woke me up early in the morning and because my tendency is to always look at what time it is to see how much time I have left to sleep. I knew it was at 1.46 in the morning. But he started to speak to me out of Hebrews about something in my life. Now it wasn't big in terms of theology or revelation, but it was something very practical. And it was right what I needed in that moment. And since I've started doing what he told me in that night season, I've noticed his presence so close. What is God saying to you? What's he been saying to you that you're struggling to grasp? God has a plan. You're not an enigma to God. I know the enemy may have told you you're unworthy. That you don't have the right stuff. Whatever that means. Just remember this, novices built the ark and professionals built the Titanic. God knows what he's doing. While the ark was in the heart and mind of God, God put the working out of it in the hands of Noah. Psalms 8, chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. And this scripture, I just, I, I really enjoy it, love it. And it says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the sons of man that you visit him? For thou madest him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. God hasn't given you and I gopher wood and pitch to work with today. 
But He has given us His Spirit. And He has put us around people who need us. Can somebody say amen? I was reading something, and this is just a little add-in. In Luke 24, 39, Jesus invited Thomas to identify Him by no other way than looking at His feet and His hands. And in our day, Jesus tells the world that they can identify Him in us by looking at His fans and feet. Juli Juliana, just amen, Daddy. Thank you, honey. <laughs> the world can identify Christ in the church by looking at our hands and feet. So God had His man. God gave him a plan. And then lastly, God gave him time. Genesis 6.3, if you remember, we quoted this last week, but there's a point that I, I want to bring out, and it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also is flesh. And this is the part that jumped out me. Yet his days shall be in 120 years. Now, I've always read this, that God was shortening everyone's lifespan. At that time, you know, Methuselah was 970 or 80 years old. I mean, they lived a long time. And I thought, well, God was just shortening everybody's lifespan to, that they wouldn't live beyond 120 years of age. And then I had to read it again. Because Noah was a dad at 500. Talk about a late bloomer. <laughs> I thought I was bad at 30-something, and I'm not going to mention anybody else's age or anything like that. But Noah became a dad at 500. That's like halfway point, man. That's like you're, <laughs> you're bringing your kids to kindergarten in your wheelchair. That, that's, that's old. You know, I always bust on Abraham for, you know, being that old, but Noah, Noah wasn't a spring chicken. So he was 500 years old when he had his kids, and then he lived after the flood 350 years in Genesis 9:28. But the first child born after the flood was a guy by the name, uh, I'm going to mess this up, Arphaxad. It's A-R-P-H-A-X-A-D. And he lived for 938 years. If you look at Genesis 11, verses 11 and 13. So if God was capping the years of people's lives, we probably would have seen it in this fellow's life, right? That's just using a little logic, right? Would you agree with that? In modern times, it's uncommon for anyone to reach 120 years of age. I actually went and looked at the, the world record, the Guinness World, and the oldest person made it to 119 in like 1825. So hitting that 120 mark seems to be something now, but not back then. Which got me thinking that maybe that 120 years was God telling Noah you have 120 years until the flood comes. So work. God had given him a countdown. I was watching uh, the highlights from the NBA Finals or the championship game of a real star player. His name's Kawhi Leonard. And he hit this Game 7 winner that was one of the most amazing shots that I've ever seen. With seconds falling off the clock, he fell away, falling out of bounds, and hit this three-pointer to win the game. It's the shot that every, every person who plays basketball practices. I always did the, the, the count, three, two, one, and you take the shot and you act like you just won a game seven. This guy actually did it for real. The point that I'm making is that when the time is clicking off, it's amazing how your energy stays at a certain point. Every person on that court was playing the best defense they could, playing the best offense they could. But the way the time was going is it brought out the best in everybody. In Genesis 6.22 it says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Noah didn't have a Home Depot or Lowe's. And no matter if you have one of their cards or not, they always offer you the discount if you open up a credit card with them. Noah didn't have that. He had to use materials that were around him. And sometimes God has to open our eyes to the things that are right around us. 
Can somebody say amen? The ark was already there growing in the gopher trees. The ark was already being sealed where the pitch was, but Noah had to see the vision of God in order to see it. Thomas, Thomas Edison said, Opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Noah had faith, and he had faithful works. Can somebody say amen? I'm just about done. We have our ushers, band come. Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3 says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, and it will not tarry. Noah in his diligence and faithfulness made sure that each measurement was accurate. The door was where it's supposed to be. The window was where it was supposed to be. I want to ask you tonight, is there anything out of place in your life? Is there anything that shouldn't be there that's there right now? Tonight, let's be like Noah and make sure we measure up. God still needs people of faith. And God still has a plan for you. And he'll give you the opportunity to work it all out if you'll walk with him by faith. We don't pretend that there's going to be trials or persecutions or distress. We just trust that the one who called us is faithful and won't forsake us. Can somebody say amen? Would, would you stand with us? We trust that he will endue us with a greater power and the power of the enemy to walk with him in this day. Tonight, if the word of God's touched you and you're unsaved and you'd like to make a dedication of your life to the Lord, I'd like to open up the altar for you to have that opportunity. Experience the presence of God in your life. Our ushers here down front would be more than happy to pray with you and introduce you to our great God. As our singers come and start singing, to give you just a moment is anyone making a decision if you're away from the Lord or if you need to be strengthened or even if you just have a need would you come and draw close to God if he's here for you tonight God bless you
to know it was harvest time in their day it's harvest time in our day God gave wisdom to Daniel knowledge understanding interpreting of dreams what is God laying on your heart you may not feel adequate but God will give you what you need to accomplish the task Amen. look at your neighbor say just go forth in faith you got a pastor, church leadership, the Spirit of God. God will help you in the journey. Tell your neighbor, God will help you in the journey. Let's sing just one more verse of that there. And just take the blessings of God home and testify to someone. Let's sing it one more time. Wide open, I will climb this. 